These are some really tough readings. Can we all sit together and parse them out? I love you too much to call you only when it's looking ugly, okay? But I will do something that I promised up, down, and sideways in my um, career. I still don't think I've actually done it, uh, is to start a sermon with a uh, story. There was a psychologist who had uh, two daughters, um, fraternal twins or non-identical non twins. And of course this helped, this kind of pushed his career a little bit and he decided to devote his life to researching fraternal twins. Now there was something that he wanted to do but he wasn't quite sure how ethical this was going to be, so of course he decided to try it on his own children first. This was the 60s. So, in the room of one child, and these, these children are about six years old now, in the room of one child, put every toy she had ever wanted, like Christmas. And in the others, he got a backhoe and loaded the room with horse manure. Because, you see, these, these kids were so different. And the child whose room had been filled with toys had this really negative outlook, like all the time she was sort of whining and crying and life wasn't fair and blah, blah, blah. And the other one always had this incredibly positive outlook. So I wanted to say, okay, let's, let's just do this extreme and see what happens. So the girls come home from school. They each get a snack, go to their rooms. And he listens for a minute, listens for a minute. And he thinks he hears crying. So he goes, and sure enough, it's coming from the room with the girl who'd gotten all the toys. He said, honey, what's wrong? He said, this is terrible. This is my entire Christmas list, and it's only September. What am I going to do? How could I? And he closes the door. He hears nothing from the other room except this sort of scurrying sound. He goes into the room. He finds the child just digging and digging and digging and just like just digging in that horse manure. She's got this big grin on her face. And he said, well, dear, what are, you, what are you doing? And she comes out, she's all covered, you know, and she says, oh, daddy, with all this horse poop, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> like I said, I swore I'd never start with a joke. But, you know, with those, with those readings and with all the sort of funky stuff that's been going around, I thought we could use it. But the real point is, we got to look for the pony. And that's going to be something I might start saying every now and then, is look for the pony. Okay? That's the shorthand for look, just looking for the pony. Because I think today's readings that are so serious and, and sad and really kind of a downer, right? I mean, first we have the prophet lamenting just seeing this utter ruin, utter ruin, not ever be the same. And then we have a epistle from somebody who loved Paul and didn't have the courage to say, I'm really sorry, but Paul just died, to Timothy. This beautiful letter that he constructs that's basically saying, Hold on to your faith. Do this. I've given this to you. It's like a spiritual will and testament to Timothy. Do all this, and I love you so much, and I trust you so much, and go forth and spread the faith and, and, and be Christ's love. But there's an ending, because Paul's life has ended. And then we have the gospel. This, oh, so problematic. No, I am not going to call John and Jack and Rob gospel. <laughs> I 
I don't know what to tell you about this gospel. I don't, I'm not so sure Jesus really said those things. But I will say that I'm hearing, of course, the anxiety of our Lord going toward his end. His end. And the apostles also anxious, but they don't quite know why. And of course, there's nothing more fun than unnamed and unidentified anxiety, like, ooh, I feel it, I just don't know what it is. And they say, increase our faith. Where's the good news in that? One little word, our. Not my, but our. Who you are, all of us together. And he says something that sounds impossible. And then he says another thing that sounds impossible. Like, Jesus, really? You're talking about slaves? Because, wait, who would, who would actually call the slaves in and say, come and eat? Oh, that would be Jesus. But it says, wouldn't, would you, you guys, wouldn't you probably do it this way? Wouldn't you rather do it this way? And what it does seem to be saying is, look, if you want me to increase all of your faith, I need you to look at the way of life that we've had together for, these, for this past long time. Everything that I've shown you, you've been following me, you've been following me, it's a way of life. You may not get a big brass band and fabulous prizes and everything that's on your Christmas list only in September because of following the Lord. You may sometimes feel like you do all that and you do all that and you get the other room. When we have endings, we can't, we don't always get the response we want from God when we're having that, that, that time, that brokenhearted time and we say, Lord, increase my faith, we may not hear what we want to hear. But if we say, Lord, increase our faith, we may find that someone else is carrying it for us. We may be carrying the entire state of Florida's faith right now, and the entire state of South Carolina's. And I loved seeing on TV when our president said, we will help you. You will get the funds to rebuild. We can't, we can't correct the devastation that has happened. But we are beside you. And we will do what we can to help find something new, to find new life, new building, even in the midst of death, even in the midst of destruction. There was a time when I was in college, I was a, um, I was a, a vocal music assistant, much like our choral scholars at Saint, at, at Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in Athens, Ohio. And I was also a uh, Saturday night but I called a Saturday night Catholic because I helped one of the voice teachers with Saturday evening mass at the Newman Center. And there was a time that I just couldn't pray. I just was, I don't even know what was going on. I can't tell you now. But I didn't really have faith. But this voice teacher that I was working with had enormous faith. And frequently, I would find myself sitting beside her during this service and saying, you know what, Lord, I can't pray. But I know that Nancy can. And so I'm going to just hang on to that. I'm going to let Nancy hold the prayers. And I'm going to trust that you're here somehow. Even if I can't feel you, I know that Nancy can. Very practical way increasing our faith. 
in all these endings in this gospel, that is all these readings today, and the endings that we have seen in our world, I begin to wonder, I really, you know, 20 years of ordained life, and I don't know if I can really give you a spot-on definition of faith. I find metaphors, I find examples, I find it's much more than just one sentence. But I believe that faith is being able to look at death, being able to look at destruction. And if we can't hold it ourselves to hold on to the hope that somebody will perhaps show us that there can be life there, there can be newness. We may not be able to see it yet as individuals, but as a community, that's what we hope for. And one more thing. There are many prophets of our age that have said that we ourselves are in the midst of a reformation. You know, every 500 years there's kind of a reformation, and guess what, we're smack in the middle of one. COVID kind of accelerated that. And so we will start looking at, whether we wanted to or not, what is church supposed to be now? How is it going to be transformed? Amen.